Happy birthday, Greenford. But would you be accountable in prayer for your community? By recognizing that your community will hear and see your relationship with God by how you pray. Now, I know you're going to pull out Matthew 7 on me and says, yeah, but scripture says we shouldn't pray to be seen. I hear all of that. But trust me, unless we pray together, unless we pray publicly, unless we share prayer, our world isn't going to know how close we can get to our Father God. Katie Kirby, Vice Chair of the World Evangelical Alliance, is today's speaker as Greenford Baptist Church celebrates its 84th anniversary. This is an encouragement to be accountable in prayer for our meeting together groups, our church family and our community using the prayer of Jesus as a model. Father God, thank you that you've been with us this morning. Thank you that you've already spoken to us, you've already challenged us. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for Katie coming and sharing with us this morning. Father, we thank you for her ministry to us in the past and for her her wider ministry within the church. Thank you for the privilege of having her here this morning, but more than that, the privilege of having you here speaking through her this morning. And we just ask you afresh to anoint her with your spirit this morning and to bring your word into our life as a church community together and into our lives as individuals through Katie. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give a round of applause and welcome? Well, I take it that was for me. Can we give an applause to our almighty God now? He's wonderful. Well, good morning and thank you for the welcome back to Greenford Baptist Church. You'll see from your uh, bulletin that was handed to me at the door, I thought it was interesting. This is my third time here. You have been warned. (laughs) It's good to be back and happy birthday to you. None of you look quite 84, but that's okay. Happy birthday to you. We sang it to everybody else, but you didn't sing it to yourselves, did you? Is it appropriate to sing happy birthday to yourselves? Why don't we do that then? Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday, dear Happy birthday to us. I I need to confess to you that on the way here I said to God confirm your word before I get there Uh, and I've been welcomed by Steve who is running a tab of everything I'm using and saying so I'm expecting a bill before I leave Uh, I've been welcomed by Warren who last time I was here was full of some kind of lurgy but he tells me he's good to go and he's been ordained and stuff since, which I think is fantastic. Means you have to act all grown up now, Warren. Not a chance, I know, I know. But God has been doing great things here, and I want to say thanks to God for confirming his word before I came, and for doing so since I've got here uh, this morning. I've said to one or two folks, because it's been confirmed, I think I can go now, okay? But I'll be faithful to the word that God's given me. And you'll hear why. When I came in this morning and was offered a lovely cup of coffee and felt very special because nobody else was apparently offered a coffee, I said to God, as I'm listening to the hymns and the prayers and the worship that went on before, I want to hear you. And the lovely lady who led the first session today began talking about what God had done, is doing and will do in our communities. Your pastor, Pastor David, got up and talked about the history and the halls and all the rest of it. And I said to God, yep, I was praying that this would be a time that Greenford Baptist Church recognises its rich heritage and hears you saying, this is where you've planted them to be and to have an effect. And he's doing that. He's doing that. The last time I was here, Pastor David, I did look around for the flag of Antigua It still ain't here. (laughs) Something to work on for next time, okay? Something to work on for next time. But what is still here is the presence of God. 
What is still here is the beautiful cross that, even though today's Palm Sunday came to be a symbol of pain and yet freedom for so many. So it's good to be at home with Greenford Baptist Church today. Turn your Bibles to John 17. And I want us to begin to hear the heart of God for you. Pastor David said, who I'm uh, grateful for for this in invitation today, but when he spoke to you earlier about the history of your church, of this community and this congregation, he said you were here because others had prepared or planned or provided for this day. And he only went back as far as 1929. Well, I want to take you right back into Bible times and help you understand that when Jesus prayed in John 17, he was praying for today. He was praying for you for today. And he was praying for the church that will be in the next 84 or 85 years. John 17, I'd like to read the whole chapter, so walk through the word with me if you can. I'm reading from the New King James Version, but follow in whichever translation you've got before you this morning. Jesus spake these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work that you've given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men who you've given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all these, all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and they have known surely that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. Now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you've given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept. None of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And now for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us, that the world might believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be the ones, they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you've loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am that they may be hold my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world O righteous father the world hasn't known you 
but I've known you. And those who have known that you sent me, I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. You can say amen, Greenford. That's God's word. And I often say that John 17 is perhaps my job description for life. It's actually the prayer of Jesus. But it feels like we've been eavesdropping on a very intimate conversation between God and his son, Jesus Christ. I'm not going to try and get into all the the historic facts as to how we come to have the record. But I do want us to realise that we have a window into the heart of Jesus when he prayed for himself, when he prayed for those who God had entrusted to him, and for those who would come after. And it's this passage of scripture that gives me confidence that you and I were prayed for for today. You and I were given a hope well beyond our time of conception that one day those of us coming after who might believe might be wrapped up and caught up in the same love of Jesus. I was inspired by, is it Vera, your testimony? I love what God's doing in you because it's very similar to my own story of God bouncing me into something almost backwards (laughs) that I might hear him and know him and do his will. And as I've shared with one or two of you since I've come in, the very fact that I'm stood in front of you today is an answer of God's prayer, not mine, in John 17. I love what we see first. We see Jesus saying, ah, finished it. (laughs) Almost sighing with relief almost using his opening prayer to say to God, I've done what you've sent me here for. Notice he's not saying in this passage, I've had enough. He's not saying in this passage that I've done as much as I can and, you know, get me out of this. I'm not a celebrity, but you know what I mean. He is saying, I have been faithful to the things you've called me for. The task, the journey, the responsibility, the challenges. I've worked, I've walked, I've loved through them all. I have done what you've asked me to do. And I love that because that's not the usual way we're taught to to start our prayers, at least not in the traditions where I come from. We've been taught to use the Our Father prayer as a model and you start with giving adoration to God. Well, actually, Jesus starts by saying, Father, oh, I'm done. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I've completed the things you sent me. You gave me a task. And here is where I'm saying I'm accountable, finished. I'm accountable, I've done what you've asked. I want to give you an example of a young boy who uh, is the daughter, sorry, the son of a a friend of mine. I went to visit, single mom with three children. And the toddler uh, was told, you know, Reverend Katie's leaving now, let's come and see her off. And this toddler, and I'm not exaggerating when I say preschool, said, can can I pray before she goes? I mean, uh, how lovely. Usually it's a thing the minister does, right? When they're leaving a house, you might say, can I pray for you? We heard examples of that today. This little toddler rustled over, nappies and all, and said he wanted to pray. And I thought, this is going to be cute. You know, it's going to be baby talk, kind of. It's going to be simple, so I'm just going to enjoy it and say amen when he's done. Well, this little boy squared himself up, asked us to hold hands like he was a bishop. I thought it was amazing. And so we did. His mother and I and his siblings, we held hands and held his, squeezed his eyes shut. And he said, God! (laughs) Well, I thought, well, if God didn't hear that... (laughs) Their neighbours definitely did. God, he said, we adore you. Well, my eyes were open at that point. Preschool, Dave. Is that the, you teach the children to pray here? God, we adore you, he says. I scrunched up. You're just amazing, he said. Now, this is sort of eight o'clock in the evening, so it should have been bedtime for this little lad. But he was quite alert and quite clear what he was praying for. He said, God, it's been great to have Reverend Katie in our home. Thank you, God, he said. I'm staring at this little boy. I usually pray with my eyes shut, but I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Thank you, God, he said. And now, Lord, as she's leaving, take her safely and protect her. And he was doing all the mannerisms that went with it. When he finished, I said, amen. I looked at his mother and I said, where did he learn to pray like that? 
She said, oh, I guess he imitates me. <laughs> he, she wasn't wrong. She could pray down fire from heaven or wherever you get fire from. And he had heard her praying and decided that was the way to pray for people when they came to his home. She prayed with him, she prayed for him, but he had developed that way of communicating with God that was just so powerful. And for a child in nappies, it was amazing to see and behold. Very clear, very audible, very passionate. That young boy is a teenager now and remembers praying, remembers asking if he could pray for me. Doesn't remember too much about what he said, but each time I go, he says, can I pray for you? My answer is always yes. He hasn't got the nappies on now, you'll be pleased to hear that. <laughs> but he's still found a way to keep praying even as a teenager. Why do I share that story? I think when we pray, we demonstrate our relationship with God. It is not about how eloquently we might speak or whether our diction's good or even our grammar is perfect. That really isn't the point. But our opening phrases, the way we connect with God, lets people know how close we are to our creator. And that's what we see in this opening chapter, uh, opening verses of John 17, just how close Jesus is to his father. In fact, he says, father. He doesn't say almighty God, maker of heaven and earth and all the rest of it. He just says, daddy. Father, God, hour has come. Make yourself great in this moment. And when our prayers can connect like that, and people eavesdrop and hear, they get a sense of how close we are to God. Not to the bricks and mortar, but as important as that is, and I'm glad you're expanding because it looked clearly you need to. But people are not going to be impressed with the size of the building in 84 years. They will remember how this church made them feel. They will remember the relationship you have with God and that you demonstrated to them. So my first encouragement to you today as we've read this scripture is actually to say, happy birthday, Greenford, but would you be accountable in prayer for your community by recognising that your community will hear and see your relationship with God by how you pray? Now, I know you're going to pull out Matthew 7 on me and says, yeah, but scripture says we shouldn't pray to be seen. I hear all of that. But trust me, unless we pray together, unless we pray publicly, unless we share prayer, our world isn't going to know how close we can get to our Father God. So that's my first encouragement to you today. Happy birthday. But would you stay accountable in prayer? with your relationship with God. Doesn't mean every time you get on the bus you have to break into prayer. And I say that having come here on public transport and seen it happen very recently. I'm not sure sometimes that that's the best witness, but it does mean that when we do pray, we're not ashamed to do it. It does mean that when we call on God's name, we're not hiding behind something as we were uh, admonished earlier on in today's service. But it does mean that people get a chance to hear just how loving our God is and how much we experience his love. Stay accountable in prayer. And that means that I'm not going to be um, writing everything down. I, I worked with the Methodists for a little while in the last three years and just love the way they record everything, everything. Everything's written down. And it's great because it means you can walk into hundreds of years of history and know what went on. And part of their tradition is writing their prayers. I'm not knocking that at all. But isn't it lovely when that communion flows from your heart to the Father God? When your heart and mind just opens up and says, God, as amazing as you are, I am giving back to you all that you've placed within me. I'm honouring you with all of my substance because you are Father God. That's what Jesus was doing. He wasn't saying, squaring up, saying, I'm perfect, got it all sorted. He's saying, I've been obedient, I've been faithful. Stay accountable in prayer for yourselves first. Then Jesus does something interesting. He moves on to pray for those disciples, all of them. Even the son of perdition, as it calls it in one translation. We know he's talking about Judas, right? We know he's talking about the one who the enemy uses to betray and eventually crucify him. But he doesn't leave him out of the prayer. He doesn't say, Lord, just bless the 11, forget 
the other one. He says all of them have been faithful. He, that says to me, he's been thinking about all 12 all the time. And those who would follow while he was there. These are the ones you gave to me, he said, and they've all been fantastic. Uh, well, they've all been faithful. They've all been good. They have all kept your word, except. And here's the thing. When we're praying for each other, because that's important, when we're reaching our arms around the Warrens and the Steves of this world, you can say amen to that. <laughs> when we're praying for people we like as well as people who might be difficult, when we're praying for people we know really well, we might be related to them or we've been at church with them for a while, or somebody that we don't know very well, there is an example in this prayer of Jesus that gives us the opportunity to include all in prayer whatever we might feel or think about them. This is what Jesus says. He says, you gave them all to me. It doesn't say they're all the same. It doesn't say they've all behaved immaculately. He says, you gave them to me and I've entrusted your love and your word and wisdom to them. It's quite clear about that. And so there's something selfless and yet uniform and yet distinct about saying, you gave me a, diff a group of people who are very different and diverse, yet I have consistently loved them and given them your truths. My second word of encouragement to you at Greenford is happy birthday. Be accountable in your praying for each other. We did some of that this morning, which was quite beautiful. We did some of that as we prayed for those who would go out on mission. And I'm praying that it doesn't stop at Easter, but keeps going beyond this season. Because the reality is this, God calls us not to just cover ourselves in prayer and to give an account of ourselves to him in prayer, but also then, I think, to pray for each other. Is that easy to do? You don't have to answer that question out loud. But I remember very early on as a Christian being upset by one or two people. My dad was my pastor and it wasn't him. <laughs> but I was upset with one or two people. And I discovered that you could do something that I now know is called psalmsing people. And it's not Psalms 23. It's about Psalms 108 or Psalms 109, where David is really upset and prays that people would be widowless and fatherless and all the rest of it, and really calls down a sense of negative anger on the people he doesn't like, but then he has to check himself and say, oh Lord, I need to praise you. It's not enough just to be angry and, and let you know I might f not feel great about certain people or certain things, but I pray that my heart would be full of praise. And when we do that, the things that are difficult, the things that are challenging, the Judas encounters in our lives don't dominate. We know they're there, but we focus on the greatness of God. And so that's what Jesus does with his disciples. He says, you gave them all to me and I have served them for you. I've given them your word. I've given them your wisdom. I'm the middle of seven children. I have two sisters and a brother either side of me, and we're all born within 10 years of each other. No twins, just mum loved having children and they kept going until all seven of us were here. Um, uh, and so you can imagine the sort of school run. Well, it was the school jog in our house. Anyway, um, uh, we would, we, mum would line us up at the door once we were at school age and they, she would pray for us every morning at the front door. Mum's a good Wesleyan minister's wife and so she didn't rush her prayers. And even if she was late, she was going to pray for every child stood at the door and we'd be going come on come on we're gonna be late and mum would say lord bless esther bless paul bless mary bless katie bless lois eunice and timothy yes all of them had bible names except me Let's not go there uh, they would pray for all of us <laughs> it's a fact no i'm just telling they would pray for all of us and then we would tear out the door and think oh great that's over and get to school years on We've all grown up now, as you can probably tell with the highlights and everything else. We're all grown up now. Some of us have our own families. Some have looked after children, foster, um, uh, not adopted, but taken in other people's children and so on. Do you know we still do the same thing? Those of us who still love Jesus and are open about it, uh, we still pray at the front door. Even if we've got no kids in the house, we stand at the door and we say, Lord, we're going out with you. Protect and cover and some of us even pray for our siblings who are not there anymore because we all live in different houses. But that pattern of praying and praying for each other, even though it seemed like a pain in our childhood days, is still with us now. And we're no longer children. 
Jesus gives us such a beautiful pattern of praying for those who God gave to him that I want to say to you on this 84th birthday in Greenford, would you continue to pray for each other? Not because you like each other, not because you get on, not because you're related, but because you're connected through the love of Christ. Not because you feel that there's some special bond between you and nobody else, but actually because Jesus modelled it for us and demonstrated a better way of doing unity than anyone else we could name or quote. He says, you gave them to me, and I want to cover all of them in prayer. Even those who go off and do their own thing, even those who don't get it quite right, if the ratio is one in 12, do the maths for your own network. <laughs> Jesus says, keep them, keep them. I love the fact, and I've highlighted it in my scripture today, I love the fact that he hasn't said, evacuate them. He hasn't said, isolate them. He didn't say, uh, remove them, because things are going to get so tough, I don't want them to be there. He says, no, keep them. Preserve, if you like. Make sure they are able to function and be who I've called them and empowered to be in the world, but they don't have to become of the world. And that's an interesting statement for us in 21st century Britain in 2014. There are many things that we can conform to. And conforming isn't just about changing behavior and saying, well, as everybody else is doing it, we're doing it. Often the conforming is when we don't speak out. And we heard about that earlier today. Our silence can give consent if we're not careful. And I believe when Jesus was praying for his disciples, he was saying, God, when I'm not around anymore for them to run back to and ask questions, when I'm not in the place where they can come and sit and break bread and we can have a chat about the day, when I'm not there on hand to say to them, you got that wrong, fellas, but try it this way next time, let them know that they can be distinct and unique in the love that you've given me for them and they don't have to conform at all. I was asked to preach at a friend's wedding recently and decided I would use the text in Genesis 1 and 2 where we know it's the creation story. And I use the word good. We often use the word good to mean possible, average, nothing to write home about, you know, you know. It was okay, no great shakes. But actually in the Old Testament use of the word good, it means the best it can be. So when God saw that his creation was good, he was saying top notch, excellent. I created this stuff, it can't get any better than this. But he does add a very, once he created humanity, he does add in a very to his good because he's seeing his creation as complete. And all too often we can look around our society and our world and a lot of it is not good, let alone very good. A lot of it is not as God created it. A lot of it is no longer as God gave us opportunity to be and become. And I believe as we're praying for each other, as we're called to pray for each other, I think the message Jesus would want us to hear through his prayer for his disciples is that sometimes there'll be stuff that comes along that challenges what keeps us together. And when Jesus prayed, keep them from the evil, from the evil one, from the evil of the world. That's exactly what he meant. Keep them so that the stuff that would divide them, would separate them from us, actually has no effect. Actually doesn't take root and become part of who they are because they know how to reject it and they know how to stay faithful to me. That's becoming harder and harder in the 21st century. You and I can go and knock on people's doors and today, they could take you and I to court for something we say in innocence and with love. It can happen. I've already said I'm sure somebody's going to get locked up for saying something genuinely and lovingly just because it upset someone or caused offence. Jesus prayed, keep them in the world. That means when we're popular and when we're not. That means when what we're saying is welcomed and when it's not. That means when we have to protest against something as well as when we have something to celebrate. Keep them in the world. Don't take them out. God wants us to have impact and he wants us to have effect. We can't do it if we're not here. You can't be Greenford Baptist Church if you're not in Greenford, right? God wants you to be kept in the world 
but from the evil of the world. And I challenge you, pray for each other because the things that you deal with, your pastor might not have to and vice versa. Things that he might have to speak up for in your community, in public spheres. It might not be you they call, but they'd look to him for a response. And you need to pray that God gives him the wisdom and the understanding and the knowledge to be fearless and yet confident in what God would have him do. Keep them, says Jesus. Keep them so that they stay true to what I've entrusted to them. Whatever laws change, whatever is redefined in communities, whatever is acceptable today and maybe illegal tomorrow, keep them, says Jesus. Not just in conversation, but in prayer. Can I encourage you on your birthday, Greenford, to move from not just being a church that expands geographically, but expands to cover each other in prayer in this powerful way that Jesus did. And not just to do it one off, not just to do it when you're amongst each other, but to do it whenever the body of Christ comes into your heart and mind. Well, here's the exciting bit, because after this service today, I've been offered lunch, but we'll see if you'll let me stay after this. Um, I, I know uh, Steve's running a tab, so I've got to be careful I don't overcharge myself. Um, <laughs> after today, I will go back to the church where God has me worshipping and working now. I won't be in Greenford after lunchtime today, all being well, but you'll be here. But Jesus' prayer didn't stop at the postcode of, of uh, UB6 or UB4, wherever we are today. It extends through time, through geography and space, to pray for those and cover those in prayer who would come after. There's no end date to that after. There is no expiry on that after. And so there's a call that's coming clearer to me, even as I'm saying it, to pray into the future for those who would come after you. I sat in a youth prayer meeting a few years ago now when I did youth work, had a bit more energy then and less highlights. I remember sitting in a prayer meeting and with other youth workers and realizing we were there because somebody had prayed that youth work wouldn't disappear and Christian youth work would have an impact in that borough. I'd like to think that in 84 years' time, in the future, down the road when you and I have gone on to glory, when people are saying, do you remember when, like we were heard earlier today, they will be remembering that somebody prayed for them today. They would know that they were prayed for, not because they were expected, but because you hope that God would continue to be a witness in this place and in this postcode. Jesus says, I don't pray for these alone, meaning the guys I've been around all this time, but also for those who will believe through their word. And it may be the word of the word of the word who those have spoken to, that they may be one. He prays for unity in a way that we don't see at football matches and we certainly don't see in political parties. But he prays for it in a way that says we're connected even over time and space. There's a sense that we should feel connected to our forefathers as well as to those who might be ahead of us. So he says, I'm not praying for those just who are here who I can see. But I'm praying for those who would come long after, years after, centuries after it, if uh, Jesus tarries. Those who would come after and believe in the same love and the same God, that they might find that unity of spirit and that covering in prayer. Because there was no end date on that, because there is no expiry, he doesn't say pray until, he doesn't say pray up to, he doesn't even stop at geographical borders. There's a sense that every nation, every people group, both male and female, young and old, are covered in this prayer for oneness and unity that Jesus prays, perhaps at one of the toughest points of his life. It's Palm Sunday today, right? And if we were around in biblical times, it would have been the time when if Maury or Gallup had done a poll, Jesus would have been doing all right. His ratings would have been up there. Trust me, he could have run for prime minister, president and everything. It was a good day. People were saying, Hosanna, woo, good to see you. Honour and adoration were going to him, but in a short space of time, that public opinion changed and the same person who they were celebrating became the person they wanted to do away with. But did Jesus change? 
Did Jesus shift his mandate? Did Jesus shift his, uh, his intention or his plan? Does Jesus become, I want to be popular, so what can I do and manage my public reputation? No. We find him praying that he will be faithful, that those around him would be faithful, and those who come after would be faithful too. It's easy to do stuff when we're popular, trust me. It's easy to do stuff when we are uh, in favour, when people are, are congratulating us, uh, when people value or seem to value what we have to do and what we offer. But what about when they don't? What about when there isn't the service of appreciation for long service? What about when there isn't the recognition? In fact, what about when they're deciding they want to get rid of us for one reason or another? I don't know how many of you in here have experienced redundancy, but I have. And I know how negative that can feel and how redundant you feel as a result of not being where you thought you might be. But Jesus prays in popularity and out, in times of credit and times of criticism, in times of celebrating, times of commemoration. Keep them, not just these, but those that would come after. That prayer of inclusion came out of this moment of solitary prayer and reached someone like me. That moment of praying and in intimacy with his father indicated that down the years, God would see a young black woman, and I am young, God would see a young black woman who would need him just as much as those 12 gentlemen who had been with him during his time on earth. And so he prays for me. He prays for you. Lord, keep her, keep them in this world. They'll believe later on they're going to need the same keeping grace and favour from me. So he asks, Father, do this. Do this connecting. Do this keeping together. Do this loving of these people now so that that witness continues into the future. I want to encourage you today to remain accountable in prayer for yourselves before God, for each other as a body of believers, but for those too who would come after. When I look in this prayer, I'm often realizing what my own shortcomings are. And I ask myself, could I pray like Jesus did in that compassionate, all-embracing way. And I'm going to be honest and say some days I don't feel like doing it, but I realise the power and the value of doing it. So I end up praying like Jesus, God, I want to be faithful to what you've called me to. Not because I'm perfect, but because I sense your love and I want to be in tune with you. And actually when I pray that way, Pastor David, the rest of the stuff begins to fall into place. The rest of the stuff begins to feel possible, not necessarily easier, but possible to do because I realize the same love that's wrapping itself around me is there for every child of God and for those who would come after. And so I have to ask myself, God, am I being faithful to what you have called me to? Am I being accountable for the things that you've placed in my life path to be responsible for and to make sure that happens? Am I being the woman, the person, the individual who you called out of darkness into light? And am I being willing to shine as that light and be salt where you've called me to so that I can have impact and be effective for you? Or am I so hemmed in by me, myself and I that I don't see anything beyond myself, that I don't see my other believing friends, that I don't even think about my community beyond the walls or the safety of the zones that I'm in? Jesus, in his prayer, I think, pushes us not to be comfortable, but to be confident that we can be in communion with our Father, in community with others, and pray for the communities that will come. I'm excited by your outreach initiative. It reminds me of the early days in the church where I grew up, where we were invited to do door-to-door. -door. And uh, like Vera, I hid behind my dad, because I was much smaller then, uh, I hid behind my dad thinking we shouldn't even be crossing somebody's threshold, let alone going to knock on their door. Uh, I didn't like dogs. That was always my excuse. What if somebody's got a dog not going to knock on their door? But just like Vera shared this morning, each time somebody opened the door, it was a new experience. 
was a new encounter. Some were pleasant, some were not so. I'm talking about the 70s and 80s when people were a little overt with their dislike or, or um, uh, not valuing what you might have to bring. But what encouraged me was seeing my dad leave Matthew 10. Somebody was nasty at one door, he shook it off and went to the next one. He didn't carry the negatives from one door to another. He didn't say, well, your, your neighbours weren't that great, so we thought we'd knock on your door anyway. He went with a new approach, as if he'd not been to the door before. This was the first one. And I learned to evangelise watching my father take the love of Jesus to complete strangers. Whatever they looked like, whatever they sounded like, whatever they smelt like. Because sometimes we go into communities and we say, dear God, keep me in here. And we realise that we're not there to be comfortable, but we're there to take the love of Christ. And so my encouragement to you today is this. Don't ask God to give you a comfortable experience of being Greenford Baptist Church for the next 84 years. It ain't going to happen. But you can ask God to give you the confidence to be the church that in the future people will remember because you prayed for yourselves, you prayed for each other, and you reached beyond the confines of the four walls and loved people into the kingdom of God. Maya Angelou says, people will forget what you said. They'll even forget what you've done, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Beautiful friend of mine got mixed up and um, had a very difficult teenage, sort of early 20s life. And when she disclosed to her church at the time that she was expecting a baby and she wasn't married, this was the days when it wasn't okay to be so, um, to living in, in such a way. Her church at the time took the very conservative view of saying, well, you can't be here. And this used to happen, I pray it doesn't happen so much now, but it used to happen where you were, you were disfellowshipped, even the words feel awkward. She was disfellowshipped and told, because of the lifestyle you've got, you can't come here. And I felt it for my friend, because I knew it was a mistake. I knew it wasn't a promiscuous lifestyle that she was trying to get the church to approve of. And I remember saying to another friend of mine, I think we should just go and see her. She doesn't come to my church, she doesn't go to yours. Can we just go and see her and let her know that God loves her? He doesn't love what she's done, but he loves her. And it was a huge risk, because we were holiness people, you know? <laughs> and we both went to the door, her from a Pentecostal church, me from a holiness church, knocked on our friend's door thinking, she's going to slam the door in our face and say, go away, you Christians. But you know, my friend said, I'm not wowed by the fact that two people have come to see me. I'm wowed by the fact that you brought God's love back to me. That friend returned to God and returned to the church, the same church that said, not in here. <laughs> she came back repentant and said, I want to be part of the fellowship of God. I'm sorry for what I've done. They eventually took her back in. She started leading worship and doing all the amazing things she was gifted to do before she made her mistake and was restored in a way that to this day is a testament of what can happen when we pray for each other and reach out to each other. Does it mean we applaud sin? Absolutely not. Does it mean we conform and bow down? I don't see that in the word. But what it does say is even when one from among us makes a mistake, becomes the son of perdition, as my translation says, we can reach out in love, not acceptance of the sin, but love for the person and let them know that this prayer still reaches them. Are you prepared to do that? I know you're 84, so you should be all grown up as a church. Uh, but are you prepared to do that? Are you prepared to be the people who say, God, we, I have been faithful to what you've called me to do. I put my arms of prayer and love around my brothers and sisters who I worship with every week. And I pray for those who would come after, just because we're going to be effective in our community. When I grew up in the uh, Wesleyan Church, we used to sing a song that, and the words went something like this Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him along the narrow road? Would you have him care your burdens carry all your load? Let him have his way with you. And I remember singing that song when I was very small and not realising what loads might be or what difficulties might be and as I got older I began to see God doing things in and through my life that whether they were painful or pleasurable I could let him have his way with me. 
God isn't calling you to be comfortable, Greenford. He's calling you to be confident that if you pray and stay accountable to him, cover each other in that loving prayer and reach beyond to your communities, the outcome of Jesus' prayer will be seen today and felt tomorrow. Would you like God to have that kind of impact through you now for the generations that will follow? Would you like the prayer of Jesus to be the prayer that is prayed by you and from you for those who would come after? I think part of the reason that it's in scripture today is that you and I can know it was prayed for us, but be part of the answer of praying it for other people. I want to go back and close with these words before we have a time of prayer together this afternoon because I think it's important for us to practice what we preach. I think it's important for us to do what the word says. Scripture says if we're hearers and not doers of the word, therein lies our downfall. So we're going to do what the word encourages us to do today. Jesus says, I pray for myself first. Father, I've done what you've asked. He then goes on to say, I pray for those you've given me. And I also want to pray for those who are outside of this number, especially for those who would come after. I want Jesus' prayer to be my prayer for all of my life. And if that's your desire today, I'd like you to stand and join me in prayer today. To respond to God's word, I want to invite you to, dare I say, imitate Jesus. And in this first short segment of prayer, to pray on your own, to pray for yourself, not to lift up yourself, but to pray as Jesus did, for him to be glorified in you. I want you to just take a moment and pause quietly before God and ask God to see your heart know your thoughts understand what he has placed within you you're willing to give back to him today you're willing to say lord glorify yourself in me let this be a time that it's you that's lifted up in what i do the psalmist says search me O god and know my heart let's take a moment to let god know our hearts and our thoughts this afternoon. Father God, praying isn't always about words, but it is about communion with you. And so I pray you'd hear the hearts of your children today. Hear us as your people saying, Lord, let this be a time when who you are to us becomes evident and real, and we have that close connection with you. Let this be a time when your word takes root in us, not just because we've read it, but because we want to become the answer to your prayer. We want to be part of solutions in our society. So you who know us and created us, you who fashioned us and called us, would you use us for your glory today? And all God's children said, Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.